Welcome back to Face to Face. I'm Kelsey Conway. He's Dave Archer. And we haven't talked to you guys in a while. Arch, it's been a few weeks since the Falcon season is over, but no shortage of news on the Falcons. And obviously the Falcons wrapped up. Coach and GM search hiring Arthur Smith as head coach and Terry Fontenot as general manager. And we're going to to get right to exactly what we can expect from Arthur Smith as head coach and what we should be keeping an eye on with Terry Fontenot as the free agency and draft process heats up. So Arch, let's just start it off with Arthur Smith and talk about what exactly fans can expect from Arthur Smith's offense. Obviously, he spent the last two years in Tennessee as the offensive coordinator, but success seems to follow him where he goes. So just what what are your first impressions of the hire and what are you most looking forward to with Arthur Smith's offense? Well, I love the fact he's a roll your sleeves up kind of guy, right? He doesn't come in with a lot of fanfare. There was some people that were talking to him around the league that were interested in him coming in as, as their head football coach. Atlanta obviously secures his, his duties or his uh, services to be your head football coach. And now what do you get? You get an offensive line guy and Hey, that's where I, that's where the bread's yeah. buttered. Now you got to have your offense. How long have we been complaining about the offensive Woo. line and what they are or aren't this guy said from jump. One of his first things he said was we are going to be solid up front. That's music to my ears, Matt Ryan's ears, whoever's squeezing the trigger for the Falcons at quarterback. You got to love the fact that you've got a guy that's your offensive coordinator, head football coach, and he cut his teeth in the offensive line, tight end area, so he knows what it takes to play up front. And think about the guys, Kels, that were up front on that Tennessee Titan team. He lost Taylor Wan to a knee injury, the number one draft pick. He had three different offensive tackles play on that side of the ball. Here's your laundry list of guys. David Quisenberry, never heard of him. He was a six-round back pick for Houston back in 2013, been with two teams. Roger Saffold, they got him in a trade from the St. Louis Rams way back in the day. He comes in. He is a he's an undrafted free agent. He's been with two teams. Ben Jones, the former Georgia Bulldog, the center. He's been with two teams. He started with Houston. Jamil Douglas. Yeah, I don't know either. He was with two teams. He, or he was with five teams. Okay, he played in Miami first. He was an undrafted free agent. And then you got Dennis Kelly, who was in Philly. He's been with two. What the reason I'm getting to all this is is because he had to mix and match guys. And when you look up. This was the number two total offense in the National Football League. It was the number two rushing offense in the National Football League. They were number five on third down. And you're going to get to an area that they really need to be good in this year here because it was a struggle here. They were very good in several other areas. In fact, in the goal-to-goal area, it was pretty good as well. But I'll let you talk about red zone. Phenomenal hire, I think, to dress up on this team is the offensive line. Yeah, and speaking of the offensive line, those games last weekend on NFC and AFC Championship game, Tom Brady is having the success he is in Tampa because of that Tampa offensive line. Of course, those weapons he has are no joke, but he never, it seems like he never gets hit. So like you just said, we've been talking about for the last four years, the Falcons need to improve the offensive line. They've obviously dedicated some of their resources to doing that, but there still seems like it hasn't really been missing. Um, and we'll have the whole off season to talk about what exactly needs to be changed, but you got to love that the guy that's coming in, one of his biggest areas of strengths is the offensive line, because of course he was a guard um, in college, but you just led me into what I was going to talk about. I I'm so excited for what Arthur Smith is going to do in the red zone. Let's put these numbers into perspective. Last year with Arthur Smith as offensive coordinator of the Tennessee Titans, the Titans ranked number two in red zone scoring, scoring 74% of their chips to the red area. The Falcons on the other end ranked number 26, scoring on just 53% to jump their tips to the red zone. And I know we talked about it a lot on the show during the season, but my gosh, it was super frustrating sometimes to watch such a promising drive, just go nowhere or have coup come on and attempt a field goal. And it, and if there's two things that we can definitely count on from Arthur Smith, of course, got to give him some time to get the right players and p- players acting act the team. But I'm excited to watch the way he draws up plays for guys like Julio, who's not really been a factor in the red zone for the last couple of years, Calvin Ridley, and of course, Hayden Hurst. Um, it should be fun to see 
the Falcons offense in the red zone once again, which I know we both can't wait to see, right? <laughs> yeah, and think about how much different this team or this season would have gone for the Falcons if you'd scored one more touchdown mm -hmm. per game yeah. when you got in the red zone. I mean, what were we, two and eight in one score games? Think about mm -hmm. one more touchdown per game. What would the scenario be? But uh, he certainly showed his prowess in that end. And let's go even further into what you were talking about, Kel. They were number one in the league in goal-to-go -go situations. 94% of the time when they got in the goal-to-go, -go, they scored. Now, yes, I get it. They had a 6'5", 250-pound running back named Derrick Henry. you got to go find a guy that yeah. can do some of those things. But a lot of it had to do with the offensive line and the scheming you're talking about, Kels, about getting the weapons the football he's got in my opinion more weapons on this team on the perimeter than he had in Tennessee I tweeted during the Packers Bucks game I can't wait to watch Arthur Smith uh draw plays to get Julio Jones freed up in the end zone like Matt LaFleur does for Devontae Adams because it seems like every game he's the number one target and we have haven't seen that from Julio. So hopefully we're seeing more Julio Jones touchdowns next year. Absolutely. So moving on with the Arthur Smith came the other coordinators that he hired, because of course he can't do it all himself. He made a big splash hire in getting Dean Pease to come out of retirement again, the established defensive coordinator for many years in the NFL to come over and run his defense. And I love the hire simply because if you look at when the Rams went to the Super Bowl, how about this? Dean Pease is 71. He's going to be running the defense for the Falcons. When the Rams went to the, to the Super Bowl with Wade Phillips as defensive coordinator, with Sean McVay, was, what is he, 33 or something? Wade Phillips is 71. So I'm still nice. like, you know, like yeah. you know but, but the point there I'm making is Arthur Smith in his first year, he's going to be so focused on the offense, although he said, I'm going to have to coach the whole team, but we know how that goes. He's going to be calling the plays on the offense. He's going to be so plugged in on what they're doing. He has a defensive coordinator who, and you're going to get into this, he has seen everything. There is no coverage or no offensive play that Dean Pease hasn't seen. And I think for Arthur Smith getting a veteran coach like Pease, and it's not just a veteran coach who's been a position coach. He's been a coordinator at three different places. He's a proven winner. Everywhere he goes, they play tough. They take away the ball and they get sacks. And those are three areas where I think the Falcons defense is really, really, really going to enjoy having Dean Pease as their coordinator. So for you, why do you think Dean Pease is the right guy for the job in Atlanta? Well, I think the, the thing that jumps off the page to me about Pease is you mentioned three different places he's been a coordinator. And not just, the just hey, he's the coordinator. They've been elite at all three places. New England, Baltimore, Tennessee. All have been very good on the defensive side of the football with a variety of different personnel. So you think, okay, well, they're elite up front. Well, they were elite here up front. No, he had, he had a mix and match. You start looking at, when you look at the players in New England, uh, that defense, they were ranked sixth in the league. They were ranked fourth in the league. They were ranked 10th in the league. They were ranked 11th in the league. Those are the four years he was at, in New England, okay? He had Vince Woolfork up front. He had Mike Vrabel, who wasn't a dominant edge rusher, but he was the guy coming off the edge. Asante Samuel in the back end. He had Harrison, uh, Rodney Harrison in the back end. Okay, let's shift gears and go to Baltimore. Now, all of a sudden, he's got an elite defensive front. He's got Suggs, and he's got Arthur Jones coming off the edge. And Halote not in the middle. So he had a really good defensive front. He built it around that. He gets to Tennessee. He doesn't really have an edge rusher. Now it's about the linebackers. It's about Brown. It's about Wesley Woodyard. And then it's about the back end. They go draft the Dory Jackson. They, they've got Bayard, the safety, who's led the list. Seven. The back seven that was pretty good. What the point I'm getting to is that he can mix and match his system to the personnel he's got in in. Make those guys elite. And the reason I say, how are they elite? Nine of the 12 seasons, he's been a coordinator. His defenses have allowed 20 points or less in nine of the 12 seasons. And that's across three different teams. That just, that just not with one team. Yeah, I'm excited about this guy. I'm excited what he brings in. By the way, he was lured out of retirement for a second time. Mike Vrabel lured him out. After he'd retired after his Baltimore days, said, hey, I'm done. I've had great defense. I'm through. Vrabel brings him out to Tennessee. And now here Arthur Smith is saying, hey, old man, I need your help a little bit one more time. 
Come help me out. And he's not too old to get it done now. Arthur, you just mentioned the, the synergy right there with Wade Phillips and him. I, I think it's going to be tremendous, and it really is nice uh, from a peace of mind standpoint. I'm running the offense. I've got a guy I can really depend on the defensive side of the ball. And I think the thing I like most about Dean Pease is he coached with Bill Belichick, he coached with John Harbaugh, and he coached with Mike Rabel. And if I asked you what, how would you define all three of those coaches, you'd probably say tough coaches who Hard demand, those, demand yeah. excellence from their players. And I don't think there's going to be any shortcuts allowed at practice in the meeting rooms. And I think this Falcons defense, we saw a lot of promise. There's a, there's a lot of room for growth, and they have some talent. So I think if you get the right guy in there like Dean Pease to get it out of them, I think things definitely look promising on that side of the ball. And we've talked about the coaches a lot, but before we close out this show, I think we should talk about the other big hire the Falcons made. And we'll be back um, breaking out free agency draft like mm-hmm. you guys have seen us before. But the guy that's going to be running the show, Terry Fontenot, I know we're both pretty pumped up about that hire. Uh, uh, For me, it's simply because he was so instrumental in bringing those key free agents from New Orleans. Um, They've been phenomenal for the last five years, and it's because of the players that they've stacked that roster with. And Terry Fontenot is a huge part in that. And everybody that I've talked to, I've talked to a number of people who worked with Terry, played for the Saints or worked in the building with him, they say uh, he's been long overdue for this job and the Falcons get the guy that they want. So I'm excited about what he's going to do. And, and we're going to start talking about BPA, best player available. <laughs> <laughs> he made that very, very aware, made everybody let everybody know, hey, we're going to take the best player available in the draft. And that's exciting. And it's certainly music to the ears of a lot of the Falcon fans. Real quickly, you talked about free agent signings in the last five years. Let me give you a couple. Larry Warford, he was four years late, spent four years in Detroit, comes to New Orleans, three state seasons, it is a Pro Bowl offensive guard for the uh, new, uh, for the New Orleans Saints, Demario Davis comes over from the Jets. He leads his team in tackles. Here's the tack. Here's the numbers Demario Davis brought with him that he that he's assembled in New Orleans. And another great get by Terry Fontenot and his pro side staff. 342 tackles for loss and 13 sacks for Demario Davis. That's a guy they went and got. Malcolm Jenkins comes over, plays safety in the back end. Instrumental, 91 tackles this year, three interceptions. And how about Emmanuel Sanders to add to the weapon, the weaponry that the quarterbacks had in New Orleans? Those are just some guys, just a couple guys that he has been instrumental in in the pro side, being the pro personnel director. That's his, that's his baby, right? He goes out and finds those guys. I think his plan is spectacular. I love the fact that what he said, Kelsey, and I'll close with this. I'll list my last thing. Is he was he's been asked a couple times on in interviews, hey, what do you think about this roster? He says, you know what? I'm not going to talk about our roster. He says, we're going to zip it up. We're going to let the other 31 (laughs) teams talk about their rosters, and we're going to glean information from them. Who don't they like? Who do they like? They're going to tell us who they like and who they are, and we're not going to tell anybody who we are. We can figure that out on our own, and we're not going to tell anybody else. I just thought that was one little little wrinkle to what he brings to the table about not, not talking about his own guys and maybe go for agency or in the draft. Uh, just one thing that I think that Terry Fontenot brings to the table. And there's a ton of stuff that you and I are going to get to over the next several weeks. Yeah, I can't wait, but we had to jump on here and give you guys our reaction to the big coaching news, but don't worry. Arch and I will be back to break down all the Falcons news regarding free agency draft season, just like we were there for you guys last year. And we've got some big, exciting ideas for you. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Falcons Face to Face.